Thank you. The next item of business is a debate on motion 12552 in the name of Lorna Slater on Circular Economy Scotland Bill at Stage 1. I would invite those members who would wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons and I call on Lorna Slater to speak to and to move the motion up to nine minutes, please, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I am delighted to open the debate on the Circular Economy Scotland Bill. I thank the Net Zero Energy and Transport Committee for its Stage 1 report and the Finance and Public Administration and Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committees for their consideration of the Bill. I was encouraged to hear so many stakeholders speak to the benefits of a circular economy when they gave evidence. Some rightly pointed out the challenges and areas where more can still be done. And this Bill, together with the range of other activity underway, will give us the tools we need to do just that. I am grateful to the NZ Committee's support for the general principles of the Bill. It made a number of detailed recommendations to which I have responded at length. I will touch on some of these in my speech today, along with the Bill's principles and the positive changes that it will bring if it is passed by this Parliament. How we view and treat our resources in Scotland is fundamental to tackling climate change and biodiversity loss. We must deliver a fundamental shift across society to reduce the demand for raw materials, encourage reuse, repairs and recycling, maximise the value of any unavoidable waste that is generated. This will require action here and throughout the UK to achieve. And the Circular Economy Bill will help this happen here in Scotland. The new powers in the bill will give ministers and local authorities the tools they need to help drive this transition. It will be underpinned by support and investment, such as the £70 million Recycling Improvement Fund that builds on more than a billion pounds of funding provided through the former Strategic Waste Fund between 2008 and 2022. At the heart of the bill is the recognition that co-design based on the principles of the Verity House Agreement and the New Deal for Business will be central in delivering this transformation. Regulations that are made under the enabling powers in the Bill will be subject to further consultation, parliamentary scrutiny and impact assessments. I note that the Delegated Powers Committee has reported it is content in principle with the powers and the proposed procedures. I am happy to recommend or to accept its recommendation regarding consultation on local authority guidance. Certainly. Morris Gordon. As a result of these measures, when will the 2013 household waste recycling target be met? Minister. Uh, the member rightly brings attention to some of the challenges that we face with meeting historical targets in this area, which is exactly why this bill needs to be brought forward so that we can set a new course. And that means setting targets as empowered by this bill, as well as taking the constructive actions we need to meet those targets. Legislation is, of course, only part of the solution, and a wide range of other measures is in train. Alongside the bill, we have published our draft circular economy and waste route map, which will provide strategic direction to deliver our system-wide vision for Scotland's circular economy to 2030. The consultation has recently closed, and the final route map will be published later this year. We are also introducing extended producer responsibility for packaging, alongside other United Kingdom governments, which will require producers to pay local authorities the full net cost of operating an efficient and effective household packaging collection service. That will provide substantial funding of an estimated £1.2 billion per annum to local authorities across the UK. The main provisions of the bill include publishing a circular economy strategy, developing circular economy targets, measures to tackle fly tipping and littering, ensuring individual householders and businesses get rid of waste in the right way, improving consistency of household recycling and improving waste monitoring. We must make a circular option the easy option for households, businesses and the public sector. So everyone in the country experiences a modern, easy-to-use waste service that helps people do the right thing for the planet. Measures in the bill 
will support the design and delivery of more consistent local services that maximize recycling performance, supporting and incentivizing positive behaviors. Certainly. Alec Riley. I'm grateful to the Minister for giving me. Does the Minister accept the concerns of the Finance Committee in terms of looking at where the funding is going to come from? Does she accept that local authorities are already under immense financial pressure and that if this just adds to that, then you know, without the funding, we're not going to go far? Minister. Uh, I'm grateful to the member for raising this point because it's a very good one. I have committed to co-design with local authorities on how we move forward with implementing a more standardised service. Now, this, of course, will require some investment funding. There will be the funding coming from the extended producer responsibility for packaging that I have just mentioned, under which local authorities will be funded to deliver and operate effective and efficient recycling of packaging. Of course, there will be some capital funding required as well, which follows on from the Strategic Waste Fund and the Recycling Improvement Fund that we already have. One of the elements of the co-design that I've committed to with COSLA is looking at other revenue raising opportunities, for example, by helping local authorities collect better quality recyclate, which can receive, uh, they can use to uh, generate uh, increased revenue. So turning to issues that were raised in the stage one report, I am pleased that the NZ committee supported a broad range of provisions in the bill, and I note their concerns about its framework nature. I hope, however, that they can accept the need to react quickly to emerging issues. Using delegated powers to make regulations allows this, as we are seeing currently with single-use vapes. We will publish the consultation on charging for single-use disposable cups in the coming weeks, which will, I hope, assure the Parliament of the approach we will take when using the powers in the bill. I also acknowledge the concerns of the Finance Committee in relation to the financial memorandum and recognize its need to scrutinize the costs and benefits of the bill. I am committed to updating both committees as we work with stakeholders to design the detail of the secondary regulations. This process is already underway. Since the launch of the bill, I have met with COSLA spokesperson Councillor McGregor on several occasions. I am pleased with this strong collaboration and COSLA's support for the aims of the bill. Councillor McGregor's most recent letter, she stated that she is delighted that we are finding such a constructive way of addressing our prime concerns and sees this as an excellent and leading example of working in the spirit of and implementing the Verity House Agreement. I am listening to... I'll take one more. Yep. Douglas Lumsden. Uh, I, th I thank the Minister for taking the intervention. Um, has COSLA also raised concerns about the, the funding that they will require to implement some pieces of this legislation? Minister. They have indeed. And as I have just responded to the other member, I am absolutely aware that there will need to be investment in order to do that. There are also other, looking at other sources of funding, indeed supporting local authorities to get best uh, profit and, and from their recyclate, as well as the, in, using that extended producer responsibility funding to implement efficient, efficient and effective services. So I am listening to COSLA's concerns and the specific concerns I was uh, discussing before the intervention was around the financial penalties for missing recycling targets, which was proposed based on the Welsh approach. We have explored whether the same aims of the bill would be better achieved through a collaborative program of work with local government to develop plans to meet targets, establish funding requirements, and share evidence and best practice. If we can continue to jointly progress development and agree a robust and effective collaborative program, this has the potential to deliver the aims of the bill to improve recycling and assure accountability. And I would be willing to amend the bill at stage two to remove provisions relating to financial penalties. I am grateful for the constructive engagement demonstrated by COSLA throughout these discussions. And I too see this as a positive example of the Verity House Agreement Partnership in action. I have also had constructive discussions with businesses about how we progress measures in ways that build on existing mechanisms to ensure implementation is simple and effective. In a similar vein, I have had useful discussions with many colleagues across the chamber, and I welcome the consensus that developing a circular economy is vital. I look forward to further positive engagement as we move through the bill process. 
This has included several discussions about fly tipping, and I can confirm that before stage two, we will publish the review of litter and fly tipping enforcement, and that this will help our consideration of whether to bring forward amendments to further address the challenges uh, de in dealing with fly tipping. I'll finish by underlining the fact that building a more circular economy is an environmental imperative, but it is also an economic opportunity for Scotland. It will open up new markets, improve productivity, increase self-sufficiency and provide local employment. I am confident that this bill is a major step towards achieving that. I look forward to the rest of the debate and to hearing the views of members across the chamber and I move that the parliament agrees to the general principles of the Circular Economy Scotland Bill. Thank you, Minister. I now call on Edward Mountain to speak on behalf of the Net Zero Energy and Transport Committee. Up to eight minutes, please, Mr Mountain. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer, and I'm pleased to be able to speak today on behalf of the Net Zero Energy and Transport Committee. I would like to start off by thanking uh, two particular groups of people. One is the committee colleagues for all their diligent work in considering the bill, and I'm sure they'd want me to extend our thanks to the clerking team for drawing together what I believe is a very comprehensive report. And I'd also like to acknowledge the careful and considered reports on the bill from the Finance and Public Administration Committee and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. The committee began our work on the bill back in June when we issued a call for evidence and hosted an online discussion on the bill. We took oral evidence in, uh, in the autumn, holding 10 evidence sessions in nearly as many weeks. Amongst all of that, we squeezed in three visits and an online engagement event with SMEs aiming to run their businesses in line with the circular economy principles. Our thanks to everyone who contributed to our work on the bill, which has been invaluable in informing the stage one report. Now, we consistently heard about the need to make progress towards a more circular economy in Scotland to tackle the climate and nature emergencies at home and abroad. At the moment, Scotland is estimated to be only 1.3% circular. A Zero Waste Scotland report suggested that Scotland's per capita material footprint is nearly double the global average, and that is simply un unsustainable. These statistics show why a circular economy bill is needed. However, the committee is unconvinced that the bill on its own will create the system-wide changes we need in Scotland, and the Scottish Government must look at additional opportunities to act. Now, the fact that this bill, it was a framework bill, presented us with some challenges. It also uh, was difficult for us to express an informed view on the bill's interplay with the UK Internal Markets Act. We have had a range of views for the use of framework legislation but we're all agreed that the Scottish Parliament must have adequate opportunity to scrutinise future regulations the Scottish Government bring forward through the Bill. And I welcome the Minister agreeing with this point in her response. Now, the Finance and Public Administration Committee has taken the view that the financial memorandum for this Bill is not adequate in terms of providing best estimate of financial cost. We think this could be mitigated by the Scottish Government committing to providing the Parliament with robust costings when regulations are brought forward under key order-making powers, and again ensuring that the Parliament has enough time to consider and take evidence on these. Let me turn to some of the Committee's recommendations on the specific provisions within the Bill. Firstly, we support the provisions to create a circular economy strategy and we support the setting of legally binding targets to drive the transformative changes that we need in, the, uh, in society. But we think the bill needs to set out how the strategy and targets will interreact. We also want to make sure that the Scottish Parliament has a greater role in scrutinising proposed targets, given their national significance to the Scottish economy and our response to the climate emergency. And we think the setting of targets should be a Scottish Government obligation and not an option. We also believe that the circular economy strategy must include more support for charities and social enterprise that promote reuse and repair. They do a huge amount in fostering a sharing economy. 
We think that regulating regulation-making powers to restrict the disposal of unsold goods should be developed in consultation with those that will be affected. We won't have a more circular economy unless the Scottish Government takes businesses on this journey with them. In her response to our report, the Minister said that restrictions would only apply to durable goods and not to food waste. I would welcome clarification for the Minister on why this distinction was not, in fact, mentioned in the Bill. On single-use items, we agree the principles of seeking to cut down on these where possible. We think additional charging could help. But we also think that care is needed to ensure that well-meaning actions do not impact disproportionately on the consumer and, in particular, uh, vulnerable groups. Now, this bill creates new enforcement powers around household waste. We recognise these measures may help stop recycled goods from being contaminated and help local authorities tackle fly tipping. But these powers must be used carefully by local authorities and only after careful engagement with householders. Turning to the Code of Practice and local recycling targets, uh, we welcome the proposals to create a more consistent and high-performing recycling system across Scotland. But the Scottish Government must ensure local authorities have sufficient resources to make the necessary improvements to their services to achieve these new standards. In particular, and a particular point of mine, the committee was convinced by the arguments for a standardised approach to bin collections across Scotland's local authorities and call on the Scottish Government to explore this in detail with COSLA. It should not be too much to ask to have the same system of coloured bins across Scotland. It could certainly help reduce confusion and also increase compliance. We also welcome a strengthening of enforcement to tackle littering and more serious forms of waste crime. But the Scottish Government must ensure these powers are fully funded, otherwise they will fall short of expectations. Now, Presiding Officer, I know time is short, and so I will conclude by saying the Net Zero Committee supports the general principles of this Bill. We give it a qualified welcome. However, we want to see the Scottish Government engage constructively with our recommendations on how the Bill can be improved. The Minister has indicated in her response she is still considering a number of the Committee's suggestions. So I remain hopeful that these improvements will be seen as the Bill progresses. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you, Mr Mountain. I now call on John Mason to speak on behalf of the Finance and Public Administration Committee. Up to four minutes, please, Mr Mason. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. And I'm pleased to make a short contribution to this debate on behalf of the Finance and Public Administration Committee. As members may know, my colleagues in the committee uh, are uh, currently in London uh, for a meeting of the Interparliamentary Finance Committee Forum, and therefore you are stuck with me. I think I'm the oldest member of the committee. The committee has scrutinised the financial memorandum for the bill, and I would like to use my time to highlight some of the key issues which we identified in our report published on the 30th of November last year. Our report raised concerns in relation to the lack of certainty and potential underestimates in the FM. We noted that a number of provisions in the Bill remain subject to co-design and therefore do not have clearly associated costs at this stage. And so, even so, the evidence we received suggested that the FM underestimates costs in relation to enforcement, education and communication campaigns and the infrastructure required to ensure that local authorities are able to adhere to the mandatory code of practice. The assumption in this financial memorandum of a 100% payment rate for fixed penalty notices is incredibly unlikely. Our report raised further concerns regarding the interaction of the bill with related schemes, including the deposit return scheme and the UK-wide extended producer responsibility. We received evidence that these have created an uncertain environment which has led to local authorities entering into short-term contracts that can provide little value for money. In relation to local councils, there is also the issue of their coming into alignment with the existing code of practice, and that is estimated by Zero Waste Scotland to be costing about £88 million. 
The Scottish Government's response to the report, which we received last week, provides some additional clarity in relation to areas such as enforcement costs and the publication of a national litter and fly tipping strategy year one action plan in May this year. We also note the Minister's commitment to provide regular updates on costings as regulations are developed. However, as has been the case with other bills recently, the Finance Committee remains concerned about the approach taken by the Scottish Government to introduce a framework bill and use co-design to develop the detail of the policy as the bill progresses through Parliament. While we do not disagree with the principles of co-design or engaging with stakeholders on policy proposals, both of which support better outcomes and improve decision-making, we are unconvinced by the argument that co-design and engagement must follow on from the legislative process, instead of being used to inform and refine policy proposals in advance of legislation being introduced. The increasing use of framework bills that seek to provide future governments with enabling powers and which do not, as a result, enable the best estimates of all the costs, savings and changes in revenue to be identified, risks the Parliament passing legislation which may, in the end, once outcomes are fully understood, be unaffordable. Ultimately, we believe it poses long-term risks to the Scottish Budget, both now and for future governments. Presiding officer, the Finance Committee still has reservations around the sequencing the Scottish Government has opted for in introducing this bill, and as stated in our report, we are not convinced that the FM, in its present form, meets the requirements set out in the Parliament's standing orders to provide, quote, best estimates of the costs, savings and changes to revenues to which the provisions of the bill would give rise, unquote. We will scrutinise closely the updates on the expenditure incurred as committed to by the Minister, alongside any savings arising from the bill. But we request that these updates are provided on a six-monthly basis, as we recommended, rather than as the regulations are being developed as proposed by the Minister. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Mason. I now call on Maurice Golden to open on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives. Up to seven minutes, please, Mr Golden. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, I want to begin today by saying clearly at the outset that the Scottish Conservatives support the general principles of the Bill. A circular economy is an economic system whereby materials are circulated in as high a value state as possible uh, in order to extract the maximum economic, social and environmental value from them. The circular, uh, circularity gap report estimates circular economy policies could see our emissions drop by 43% and our resource consumption reduce by almost a half. But progress has been painfully slow, with Scotland's economy just 1.3% circular, as my colleague Edward Mountain has highlighted. Unfortunately, this circular economy bill, as drafted, won't deliver the change we need. In fact, it feels like a reaction to missing the 2013 household recycling target than a serious attempt to deliver a circular economy. Factor in the proposals on littering and fly tipping, and what the Scottish Government have presented isn't so much a circular economy bill as a waste and litter bill. Even at a basic level, the bill doesn't explicitly set itself the mission of driving the system needed to encourage prevention and reuse. Members are well aware of my personal uh, uh, commitment to building a circular economy. In fact, when it looked like the Scottish Government had all but abandoned a circular economy bill, I offered to introduce one myself. So the Minister knows I am being sincere when I say I stand ready to work constructively to strengthen the bill. And it does need strengthened not least because it has been introduced as a framework bill. That means there is precious little detail, a concern highlighted by both the Finance and Net Zero committees. And it also means there is no guarantee of when, or even if, ministers will take action. The provision to publish a circular economy strategy is a good place to address such concerns not that legislation is required to construct said strategy. 
a robust process here would signal a determination to act. So I hope the Scottish Government pays heed to the concerns raised about the current proposals, from an inadequate consultation process to a lack of clarity of how Parliament will scrutinise draft strategies. We need to see similar robustness when it comes to setting statutory targets for developing a circular economy. But the Scottish Government wants to make setting targets optional. They cannot possibly expect households and businesses to take the circular economy seriously if they themselves say it's only optional. Now, I appreciate the Scottish Government has a poor track record on statutory targets, having missed eight of the past 12 emissions targets, not to mention today's bombshell mm -hmm. from the UK Climate Change Committee that the SNP Green Coalition are set to miss the 2030 net zero target, saying <coughs> it's beyond what is credible, a complete and utter dereliction of duty. Going forward, there's clearly a need for ministers to be more accountable for missed targets, and they could make things easier for themselves by ensuring the underlying policies are firmly rooted in evidence. That's not always the case, though. Just look at the proposal to restrict the disposal of unsold goods with France cited as a model. So, you would think the Scottish Government would have spoken with their French counterparts about it, but the Minister has confirmed they haven't. Similarly, it's not immediately apparent what assessment has been done on the priority materials identified in the circular economy route map. Now, let me turn back to household waste. Proposals to develop a new code of practice for local authorities on waste and recycling along with local recycling targets could help drive up recycling rates. Local authorities also need to be committed to this aim. <coughs> For example, Glasgow City Council have proven year on year they are not. But neither is, is going to matter unless local authorities are given the resources to do the job. There's also clearly a role Happy. Minister. Uh, to remind the member, although I'm sure he knows, that Glasgow City Council has recently been a recipient of the largest tranche of recycling improvement fund money that has been given out to date. Morris Golden. My point was they have proven year after year to not care about driving up household recycling rates. That's the track record. That is very much evident. It's nearly impossible to have such low recycling rates. I'm trying to work out in my head how they keep it so low in Glasgow. Uh, but clearly, there's a role for COSLA as well, and also ensuring waste experts in helping such proposals fit the circumstances or different local authorities, particularly those island and rural authorities. Similarly, penalising households who fail to live up to their responsibilities should be a last resort. <coughs> Everyone in society has a responsibility for their own waste, but the default approach should be education and positive engagement. Again, local authorities need the resources. Let me say that, though, that concerns we see are not insurmountable, but solutions will require all stakeholders to work constructively. There's so much that should be contained in this bill, from public procurement to system design, from take-back provisions to sustainable consumption, from reuse targets to scope three emissions reporting. That's what I want to see, and I hope it's what the Minister wants. So let's get on and do it. Thank you, Mr. Golden. I now call on Sarah Boyack to open on behalf of Scottish Labour. Up to six minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome today's debate because Scottish Labour strongly supports the principle of legislation on the circular economy. But I want to echo the comments that have already been made, that there's a lot of work that still needs to be done to ensure that this bill really is a circular economy bill and not just a recycling bill. 
First of all, I want to thank the Net Zero Committee, its clerks and all those who have given evidence in advance of today's debate. And I also want to thank those who have sent us briefings in advance of today's debate. Um, I note the change of timing means we might not have actually considered them all in detail, but they will be very useful in the run-up to Stage 2's amendment process. And I want to be upfront that the Stage 2 discussions on this bill will be crucial because there is so much in this bill that needs to be amended and clarified. It's a framework bill. There are key areas where we need more detail, where we need to see the development of the respectful partnership with local authorities and investment to make sure that the aspirations of this bill will actually be met. So we've heard some nice words from the Minister today about the relationship with local authorities, but we need to see the detail. We need to see the progress, the key milestones, the dates that are going to be there, and the code of practice and how it will be produced, and then how the Parliament will be consulted. That's been mentioned already. I know from talking to my colleagues in Wales, it shows what can be done when the government and local authorities work together with the billion pounds from the Welsh Labour Government invested just over a decade to enable local authorities to gear up and deliver the infrastructure needed in communities across Wales. And it works. Crucially, their investment has led to recycling levels of 64%, with a statutory target rising to 70% next year. Yes, of course. Morris Golden. Success in Wales, which the member was alluding to, does the member support this approach, uh, the, the Welsh approach of the Welsh Government being applied to Scotland? Sir so Boyack. Could we have Ms Boyack's microphone, please? Okay. The key thing is cooperation, partnership and funding. And that's the critical issue that I want to come on to because I've welcomed the work of the Net Zero Committee, but the Finance and Public Administration Committee was pretty blunt in their comments. We heard that today. We need to make sure that the addition of new responsibilities is actually funded. Otherwise, that will be incredibly damaging to our councils and it will be ineffective in terms of output. In their report, the Finance Committee said the committee is concerned that this lack of clarity um, in concerning the funding required for local authorities to align with a new upgraded mandatory code of practice could render the approach unaffordable and unsustainable. And worryingly, as we've heard already, they commented that the financial memorandum is not adequate. So although we had some nice warm words from the Minister earlier, we need more detail. We don't just need to hear about what might happen, we need to see a much more coordinated approach. And because this bill is a framework bill, it also creates major concerns about the lack of effective parliamentary scrutiny, especially if the Minister is going to react quickly. We need proper consultation for parliamentarians, for stakeholders and for businesses. And we need targets that are going to be deliverable because that's critical to the creation of a, a circular economy because at the moment the focus is recycling. So we need to have more about redesigning opportunities so we can see reuse, repair opportunities in our communities. And we need the investment from that. And that means clarity in relation to recycling. So we need to have an approach that reflects the different challenges across the country. For example, making sure that there's accountability for separating waste and effective recycling is important, but we need communications from the Scottish Government and local authorities. I welcome the fact that we've heard today from the Minister that she's intending to remove the penalties in the bill for individual constituents. So, for example, in my area, city centre residents who live in flats and tenements and are doing the right thing, separating their waste, trying to reuse products, they could still be fined if it's deemed that somebody has put uh, the wrong waste in the wrong box and it's their fault. So I'm glad that approach has been taken today. But it's if it's very brief. Uh, Sorry, I, I just want to clarify the point to make sure the member has not uh, misunderstood me. Um, the, I'm looking at the provision for finding local authorities, which is the Welsh approach. Um, that is the provision that I've been discussing with Kozla, not the provision that you've just referenced, which at the current is a, uh, it's a criminal approach if people do not desist in uh, contaminating recycling once they have received a notification. So the approach to apply a more proportionate measure for local authorities on that is still part of this bill. Some of my uh, time you get back. A bit of time back, Ms. Boyer. Thank you for that. Well, um, 
When the Minister goes into detail, that's when we get worried, isn't it? Because in the way you presented what you were changing at stage two, I clearly saw it as addressing the concerns that have been made by many MSPs. The challenge is people who live in flats and tenements and city centres, they could be incorrectly blamed for somebody else's failure to address this bill properly. So we need more consultation on that and more discussion at stage two. It, the, we need the to join up bringing approach. I need to, I need to come towards the end. We can't ignore the issue of how much waste we export from Scotland. And we know that our consumption target, our consumption emissions have increased. So I hope that the Minister will con commit to supporting amendments to address that issue at stage two and commit to effective monitoring because the principle of carbon tar consumption targets and the analysis of our international carbon footprint is key if we're going to deliver a just transition. That's not currently in the bill. It needs to change. I'd also like to hear from the Minister about work for the Office of Internal Market to ensure the regulations will be deliverable. Uh, that's critical particularly given the DRS fiasco. We also need to see support and encouragement for businesses, because if we're going to have a circular economy, we need more than what's in this bill. The Scottish Government could take a lead by making sure that their own purchasing procurement works to incentivise products that are designed with the circular economy principles baked in from the start. The principle of building a circular economy has got to be what we deliver in this bill with sectoral approaches, action from day one, whether it's reducing our reliance on single-use products and ending food waste. The waste hierarchy is key. Redesign products to prevent waste in the first place. Ms. Boyd, you will now need to bring your remarks to close, Recycling, please. and let's get the amendments to deliver a circular economy, not just a recycling bill. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you, Ms. Boyack. And I now call on Liam MacArthur to open on behalf of the Scottish Liberal Democrats. Up to six minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, well, this debate suddenly feels uh, all the more uh, timely, having uh, been brought forward by 24 hours. It now helpfully coincides with the sobering confirmation from the UK Committee on Climate Change that the prospect of Scotland meeting its 2030 climate target is now, quote, beyond credible. UK CCC Chief Executive Chris Stark has been characteristically blunt, criticising the government for having no plan in place to get anywhere close to hitting the target. Chris Stark was clear in stating that this uh, is a, quote, failure of the Scottish Government to bring forward to the Scottish people and the Scottish Parliament a climate change plan that is fit for purpose. And for an SNP Green government fond of trumpeting first, Ms, uh, first, Mr Stark added, quote, this is the first time anywhere in the UK that the UKCCC has said there's a target that can't be met. So the context for today's debate and the legislation we're considering is both clear and it is challenging. Uh, and at this point, uh, in customary fashion, let me uh, also add my thanks to the Net Zero Committee and the Finance Committees uh, for their uh, Stage 1 scrutiny work on the Circular Economy Bill. Uh, and can I also add my thanks to the Minister. Uh, my remarks this afternoon will focus primarily on concerns that have been raised, but um, I have been very grateful to Lorna Slater for her willingness to engage constructively with me over recent months in relation to this bill. Fundamentally, though, engaging on this bill has been far from straightforward, as both the Net Zero and the Finance uh, Committees uh, have found to their obvious frustration. A lack of any real detail in this framework bill makes it incredibly difficult to scrutinise or even understand, uh, the, in, in, in the broadest possible sense, what impact it will have in reducing our reliance on carbon-intensive extraction and use of materials. The bill commits ministers to publishing a circular economy strategy, which is, of course, very welcome, and presides, uh, pr uh, provides them with a wide range of powers to be used in enacting the strategy. Yet we remain in the dark about how these powers might be used. Even the current consultation on a circular economy route map simply focuses on policies within the scope of existing powers. The commitment to co-decision policies with uh, local councils and wider stakeholders, again, is all very well, but the decision to press ahead with introducing this bill before that process has been completed, or in some cases even being uh, commenced, is worrying. It certainly leaves Parliament in an invidious position. As the Finance Committee pointed out, it makes financial scrutiny, quote, incredibly challenging, if not impossible. It's also, of course, part of a pattern, as we're seeing with this government's hapless attempts to centralise care services. 
And there are obvious risks, not just uh, the difficulties for Parliament in carrying out its responsibilities for scrutiny. It vests significant future powers in ministers, as Sarah Boyack pointed out, reducing their accountability to Parliament, to stakeholders and indeed the wider public. In turn, this heightens the risk of any legislation falling apart on impact with reality. Again, not an unknown phenomenon for this government. Likewise, the risks of future powers coming into conflict with the Internal Market Act can only be increased by the approach being taken here. Well, we have two governments at present who seem to love nothing more than a constitutional spat. What our climate and indeed our economy can ill afford are more DRS disasters littering the legislative landscape. So either ministers must give more detail about their intentions or the bill should be given uh, teeth with more specific requirements and ministerial obligations placed on the face of the bill. One example, which I know the Net Zero Committee has identified, is setting targets for producer responsibility, extending from packaging to products themselves. Uh, this could include take-back, requiring producers to accept return uh, of a set proportion of their products after consumption and to refurbish and reuse a percentage of those. This could ease the burden uh, of circularity on cash-strapped uh, councils or individuals and provide a, a welcome incentive to manufacturers to produce according to circular economy standards, something I know the uh, COSLA have been keen to press during stage one. Overall, though, as the Net Zero Committee rightly say, there needs to be a balance between consumer and producer liability. In saying this, can I uh, make my usual plea for any provisions to be properly and robustly island-proofed? It's a point I've made to the Minister during our uh, various discussions over recent months, and I have no in uh, hesitation in doing so again today. Take-back schemes uh, perhaps off offer a perfect illustration of something that may work very well across most of the country. In island communities, though, I suspect the logistics and the infrastructure required will inevitably present very different challenges. So, I urge the Minister and indeed the committees uh, to have this very much in mind as they consider amendments to this bill during stage two. For now, notwithstanding uh, the misgivings I have outlined and the work that is quite obviously needed to get this bill into shape, uh, Scottish Liberal Democrats will be supporting the bill at decision time this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Mr MacArthur. We will now move to the open debate and I call Ben McPherson to be followed by Graeme Simpson. Speeches of up to six minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. I believe in the circular economy as a good in itself, as somebody who doesn't like nonsensical waste and believes in the efficient use of resources as reasonably as possible. But the circular economy is not a new concept, uh, but it is a re-emerging trend. And our consideration of this bill is part of that shift in social consciousness. You know, borrowing a book from a library, shopping in a charity shop, buying anything second hand, that's the circular economy. And there are many, many other examples. So the concept is long standing, but due to a number of factors, building a more circular economy is trending. And the ambition of this bill is to progress development of a more circular economy with more and better reuse, refurbishment and recycling. Part of this trend is a response to an increased uh, use of single-use items in recent decades. But personally, I don't think this should be the focus. I think we would be better to focus on the benefits of reusing and refurbishment rather than the detriments of single-use. And the encouraging position is that trends towards a more circular economy are already happening as we consider this legislation. For example, in Edinburgh Northern Elite, in my constituency, we have the Remakery, the Tool Library, and Way to Go that we visited as a committee. Nationally, there are so many examples from the way the hydro in Glasgow uh, uses its uh, reusable cup facility to reblade, which are a remarkable company working in terms of uh, renewable uh, approaches in terms of the circular economy when it comes to using the, the blades of, of wind farms. Internationally, there's uh, facilities like Vinted, Gumtree, the list goes on. So the challenge is how do we legislate in a way that de usually develops this? Uh, and how does government inform, support and encourage rather than punish the public who, in my experience, uh, and businesses too, want to do the right thing? But we, we need government to lead on system change, communications, coherence and infrastructure. Uh, and measures to tackling uh, unsustainable consumption and, and, and supply chains are part of it. 
but we need to be mindful of the, rest the restraints on the government's uh, ability in this area uh, in just a Scottish context. But perhaps there is more that we can do in terms of producer responsibilities, particularly on items like uh, sofas and mattresses that end up being fly-tipped in constituencies like mine. So if we focus on business practices and supporting reuse in a deliverable and meaningful way, I think we can make this bill something that makes a, an impactful difference. And, and this is really complicated, but one area that I think the bill should focus on that it doesn't at the moment is construction. 50% of the waste in the Scottish economy relates to construction, we heard as a committee. So I think we must consider the role of the built environment, not just in terms of waste, but also the opportunities, the jobs that could be created. Uh, and that was relayed to us by the Built Environment Forum Scotland, uh, Resource Management Association of Scotland, and also the architectural firm Page and Park. So I would like to work with the government on an amendment that relates to construction, whether that's a specific identification in the strategy or something that we can do on the face of the bill. And we need facilities to enable people working in the construction trade to be able to uh, see the reuse of, of, of materials. Yes, briefly. Morris Gordon. The, does the member support mandatory scope three reporting for the construction sector? Ben McPherson. Something I would need to look at in more detail, but I'm, I'd be delighted to receive uh, more information on that. Um, I think as well, given that the construction industry accounts for 50% of the waste in the Scottish economy, I think we have to include it. Otherwise, it seems naturally unjust to me to put, uh, to, to put obligations uh, and sanctions potentially on households and consumers and not to look at the area of the economy that produces the most waste. In terms of household waste, uh, we need better reuse facilities. Um, I have an iron, for example, that's broken. I have nowhere in our capital city where I can go and get it fixed. You know, that's where we are. So we need to see the investment in the third sector, it, from the public sector, we need local authority hubs. We need that infrastructure. And that will also help in reducing fly tipping because we need to make it easier for people. People want to do the right thing. And I agree with what the convener said and what was emphasized in the report. We need a standardized recycling process that is island proofed uh, but this will not only make it easier for people to recycle, but it will also reduce costs and bring more investment and uh, make communications easier, which are a problem at the moment. On uh, single-use items, I do think uh, that there are good arguments for charging on single-use items. The plastic bag charge has made a difference. Personally, I'm not convinced yet on a charge for disposable beverage cups. I worry what it will do in the cost of living crisis, the impact on small businesses, the inconvenience it will create. It's different from a plastic bag charge, and I would refer the Minister to the feedback from Scottish Hospitality. Perhaps we should take an approach that really focuses on health and fire risk uh, and environmental damage rather than just single use in itself. Um, and also, uh, if we are going to have a charge, I think it should be uh, local, the businesses collecting the charge can spend it on charities of their, their choosing. Um, lastly, Littering from vehicles, is there anything more antisocial? I fully support the charge on that. This is a, a good start. This has the potential to be a great bill that makes a long-lasting impact, but let's work together to make it better. Thank you, Ms McPherson. I call Graham Simpson to be followed by Bob Doris. Mr Simpson. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I found myself today with a sense of deja vu. I recently spoke in the Stage 1 debate on the cladding bill and the issues around cladding and fire safety. And I said in that debate that I could very reluctantly support the general principles of what I see as a deficient bill, but that support would expire if improvements are not made. And that's my view of this bill, hence the sense of deja vu. It's yet another framework bill that leaves so many questions unanswered, would give the government sweeping powers to potentially do some pretty shocking things, all with little parliamentary oversight. And the Net Zero Committee makes this point very strongly, and it's right to do so. It's hard to argue with the general principles of the bill, but you don't need legislation to have a strategy or to set targets. You just get on and do that. Now, let me start by mentioning the report from the Finance Committee. We've already heard um, some of that. It said, based on the evidence we received, the committee believes that enforcement costs 
are likely to have been underestimated. And while we note the Minister's argument that these powers would be used at local authorities' discretion, they should nevertheless be accurately reflected in the financial memorandum, ensuring that all local authorities are financially able to utilise the enforcement powers will be important if the Bill's ambitions are to be delivered. And they go on. The committee notes the cost estimates from Zero Waste Scotland of bringing all local authorities into alignment with the existing code of practice would be £88.4 million. We're therefore unclear how much more funding will be required to support local authorities to meet any, quotes, further requirements in the proposed mandatory code which the Scottish Government considers necessary to meet its waste targets. It's actually it's a pretty damning report. And not for the first time, the Finance Committee has slated a bill for not having a realistic bill. I have very real concerns about the sweeping powers that the Government wants to award itself. On charges for single-use items, this could be a container that you might get a takeaway meal in, a fish and chip tax. And what about the proposed bin fines already mentioned? Should you have the wrong items in there? I can see responsible people putting out their bins only for someone else to come along and put something else in, in them being hit with a fine. And what do we do about people who live in flats with communal bins? If they have the wrong items in, in them, do they, all get, do they all get fined? I don't know. It doesn't say in this bill. Now, we have a suite of responsibilities for councils, but with no financial recompense. And the Net Zero Committee referred to this in its report when it said, we are aware of the pressures local authorities are facing, which makes increasing recycling performance challenging. The prospect of penalising councils for failing to meet targets seems counterproductive and only serves to exacerbate existing constraints on local authority budgets. Well, um, I will, but I did hear the Minister earlier, so I take the point on board, and she's giving me the thumbs up to that. Good. Indeed, uh, Consumer Scotland said additional support may be needed for local authorities with higher levels of geographic isolation, another point that's been made, or deprivation. Perhaps the most damaging aspect of the bill is the section around restrictions on the disposal of unsold goods. I don't know of any business which would want to deliberately have unsold goods lying around. It doesn't make economic sense. This whole section is incredibly vague, but we could have a situation where small and large businesses are being fined simply for having excess stock. That's highly likely to lead to a cross-border trade in stock just to avoid Lorna Slater's unsold goods tax. But Ms Slater has not spoken to the UK Government about the potential Internal Market Act implications of the bill, or at least she hadn't when she gave a comment to the Scotsman on March the 9th. Maybe she has since. Now, you would think she might have learned her lesson on that from the deposit return debacle. Apparently not. There is a large section on littering from a vehicle. Most of us would call that fly tipping. This does need to be tackled because it's a blight on our communities. Murdo Fraser, the Scottish Conservatives' very own uncle Bulgaria, will have more to say uh, on this. The bill needs to be improved, but we also need more sorry about that, more on the face of it and less in regulation and the government needs to be put on notice that it needs to spell out its thinking in more detail. A circular economy, I'm struggling to get through this, a circular economy is one where we reuse more, throw less away, cut down on waste and we'd all agree with that. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr Simpson. I just say I'm very grateful. I've learned something entirely new today about Bulgaria and the Rumbles. Um, moving on, I call Bob Doris to be followed by Monica Lennon. Uh, yes, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, the Circle Economy Bill before us presents a real opportunity 
to tackle various environmental blights that we all wish to see action on. Action on charges for single-use items, such as coffee cups, as we've heard mentioned. Action on fly-tipping, also from cars. Greater penalties for those who commercially fly-tip and on households who take those too good to be true deals for the removal of goods. We all know the ones. Man with a van takes your old bathroom or old kitchen for a few pounds. Do households really believe such operators are acting to dispose waste ethically or appropriately? I doubt it. Households must take reasonable steps to ensure that waste is uplifted by a reputable operator or households could face fines. And quite rightly so. Or our committee's suggestion and action to streamline and standardise domestic waste collection across our local authorities, as we heard from the convener. But there are much more significant matters contained within the Circular Economy Bill. But I de deliberately highlighted these, firstly, as matters such as charges for single-use items, fly-tipping and domestic waste. This is because such actions can have a direct and a visible impact on our everyday life. And on that front, I would actually welcome the Scottish Government seeking to work with local authorities move to a free curbside collection service more generally and more communities across Scotland because I do think that charges for curbside collection and household collections have a detrimental impact on our local environments. However, uh, if I can get the time back. Well, let's try and accommodate it within yeah, time. Okay, right. Mr McPherson. Does Bob Doris agree with me that be because of facilities being far away or people not being formed, some people inadvertently fly tip. So free collections would make a difference in that regard. Bob Doris. Uh, um, I thank Ben McPherson for the intervention. Yes, there's inadvertent fly tipping or unwitting fly tipping, but uh, I think it's people who always understand that the free collection has been removed and they put their refuse where well, they've always put it, despite the fact that charges apply. But it will vary across local authorities, Mr McPherson, but it, it needs to be tackled, I think. However, this circular economy bill is much more. It needs to place responsibility at a sectoral level, a producer level, a procurement level, not just with consumers. Seeking to tackle overproduction, seeking to reduce waste and to embed a reuse and recycle culture into how we all do our everyday business sits at the heart, or should sit at the heart, of the circular economy bill. We need to work with Scotland's public and private sectors to take meaningful action to tackle overconsumption and to reduce waste. There is no doubting the scale of the challenge, and the committee has recognised this. The Circular Economy Bill is only one part of a much larger picture, and the government also acknowledges that. At the core of the Circular Economy Bill sits the development of a new circular economy strategy, placed on a statutory footing. That will be key. What sits in that strategy will set the tone and the direction for years to come. And I would like to consider that as yet to be developed strategy from an international perspective. Indeed, this is highlighted in our stage one report at section 180. The committee notes it was suggested in evidence that section 13 of the bill could include global considerations and the aim to do no harm. In particular, a joint submission from international charities, the Scottish Catholic International Aid Fund, SCIAF, and Siembra Columbia, also suggested this provision could also be strengthened by placing a requirement on Scottish ministers to ensure the strategy, and I quote, must have regard for the goal of promoting international realisation of human rights in supply chains. Strengthening the bill in such a way could help Scotland's public sector make the most effective use of our purchasing and procurement powers and to sharpen our understanding of our often global supply chains. It can help drive change in the private sector to do better in this area also, and I stress in partnership with industry to drive that change, not against them, in partnership with them. Indeed, perhaps there is a mechanism by which the Global South can have a meaningful input into how Scotland develops our strategy in the first place. However, I want to return to where I started. That is an acknowledgement that for many who understandably won't follow the finer details of legislation in this parliament, the visible aspects of this legislation will be what they can see in their own, neighbourhood, in their own neighbourhoods. So that does mean success for some will not be judged on the circular economy ambitions as vital and as important as they are. 
It will be judged whether they see less phthalate tipping across their communities. It will be judged whether they see less coffee cups, disposable vapes dumped across communities. We can't always legislate for that, presiding officer. Some of it is behavioural change. And I think MSPs across all parties will know that littering can be endemic within communities. And no sooner is an area cleaned up that the next day it's as bad as it ever was again. And then all councils of all political persuasions get it in the neck. Why don't you clear up litter in our communities? Even though the day before, that's precisely what happened. So behavior, behavioural change globally, behavioural change nationally, and in our local authorities in terms of a circular economy. But we also need a real behavioural change locally. And that's all our attitudes of how to respect our local environment. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you, Mr Doris. I now call Monica Lennon to be followed by Jack and Debar. Ms Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As a member of the Net Zero Energy Transport Committee, I'm pleased to be speaking in the debate and associate myself with the remarks of the convener, Edward Mountain. Um, other committees were involved, but I want to put on record my thanks to, to our clerks, to the SPICE team and to the many, many witnesses who informed our evidence. We had 10 sessions, there are 80 recommendations, and I think, although today there's a lot of, sort of robust uh, debate about this uh, bill, I think there's a lot of passion across the chamber and a lot of agreement. So we need to become a more circular Scotland. No one disputes that. Um, so we need to harness that passion. And what we're hearing from our communities and the local authorities in our area is about how we can make this better. Because Sarah Boyack, my Labour colleague, is absolutely correct. Stage two is absolutely crucial. And I believe that the Minister does have an open door to work with colleagues and people across the country. And I think we all have to, to cooperate that. Um, I also hope that Ben McPherson finds someone to repair his iron by the end of this debate. Um, I've had a wee Google search and sent him a, a link to a business in, in Edinburgh that might be able to, to help, but it's, it's, it's knowing where to go to get... Of course. Ben McPherson. <laughs> I, I think the point that Monica Lennon was about to make, it's about knowing where to go, and we need greater awareness of that knowledge and also greater numbers of facilities. Monica Lennon. Absolutely. So we'll probably... Um, made that demonstration uh, on the record now in, in the Parliament. So I think we all agree the bill is necessary. We need legislation. Um, and in 2022, Keep Scotland Beautiful declared a litter emergency in Scotland, and that's undeniable. So despite years of campaigning, people doing litter picks, people trying to do their best to recycle, we know we've still got a massive problem with litter. And that's a symptom of a much wider issue, a reliance on a linear economic model where we continually extract new resources to make new things and new products, and then we throw them away before starting all over again. So we've got to break that, that cycle. Um, it's having a serious impact here in Scotland, but also around the world, as others have said. Um, SEPA has data to show that between 2018 and 2022, around 100 tonnes of plastic packaging waste was shipped from Scotland overseas every single month. You know, that is a real scandal. So the question is, you know, what can this bill do to, to tackle some of this? Others have said there's a concern that um, there's too much focus on the recycling part of the waste hierarchy. I believe the Minister will take that um, in the spirit as intended. We do need to look at, you know, other aspects of the waste uh, hierarchy. And we've heard there's a lot of passion for reuse. Um, and repair. So one example I want to touch on today, and people who know me know I talk about uh, this a lot, is reusable nappies. So we need to make it easier for people who want to try and do the right thing environmentally, but are worried about the cost and other barriers. Um, in the spirit of that collaborative approach, um, the Minister and I are doing a, a fact-finding visit uh, next week to North Ayrshire Council. Um, because since 2019, they have been leading the way, uh, not just in Scotland, but in the UK. Um, third sector partners are involved, the local authority. It was brought in by my Labour colleague, Councillor uh, Joe Cullinane, but it's been continued by an SNP administration. And it's the kind of thing that actually can help all of our constituents. It's cost neutral to the local authority. 
So I am looking at amendments for stage two to see how we can do that. But doing that with their local authorities, not telling them what to do, but enabling them and giving them the confidence to, to work on that. Um, another big issue for me in this uh, bill is around food. I think we need to do much, much more to reduce food waste. You know, we have the, the scandal of you know, ever increasing food poverty and food insecurity, but also we're seeing food waste increasing as well. So something is not... Of course. Minister. Thank you very much to the member for taking an intervention. I'm just flying up to the member and to, indeed to the chamber that I've recently received a copy of a letter from the British Retail Consortium to my uh, colleague Steve Barclay down in London asking for mandatory food waste reporting to help measure and judge food waste and understanding that food waste is contributing to 10% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Um, I assume the member welcomes the fact that industry itself is also looking at food waste and is asking us to put in place exactly the sort of provisions that are in this bill. Monica Lennon. Yes, I think, you know, we need industry to absolutely play its part, but we know that, you know, this doesn't happen on a voluntary basis. So we need legislation. I think um, colleagues mentioned France. We know that California is a really good example where through legislation there's now requirements on household and business to separate green waste and food waste and donate um, edible waste to food recovery groups and to recycle the rest. So um, I think there's more that can be done um, at stage two to, to look at that. Um, time is short. I think you know others, including Bob Doris, have talked about the international impact of what we're doing here. We did get really good evidence from SCIAF, so I won't repeat some of the points. There is a good um, briefing, but we know in terms of um, clothing, in terms of textiles and food waste being exported, there's a big issue there. It's also about, and I think as Ben McPherson talked about, it's the economic benefits, but it's the social imperative as well, because we know where the environment is exploited, people are often exploited too. And the, the example that really um, you know, kind of influenced me heavily was through Fashion Revolution Scotland, who came together because of the, the disaster in Rana Plaza that killed thousands of garment workers. So people working in the most awful, exploitative conditions, losing their lives, losing their health, so that people in the global north, like us, can buy cheap clothes that we might wear once and throw away. So there's, I think, a lot we can do through the bill in terms of amendments, but also through the strategy. But I think, as others have said, we need that cooperation, we need the collaboration, and we need certainty around funding. That means costed plans. And I think if we put all these things together, we can, I hope, work towards a more circular Scotland. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Lennon. I now call Jackie Dunbar to be followed by Mark Rusko. Ms Dunbar. <clears throat> Thank you, President Officer. As a member of the Net Zero Energy and Transport Committee, looking at the basic principles of this bill has been of great interest to me, and I'm pleased to be able to take part in today's debate. Can I first of all uh, take the opportunity to place on record my thanks to the, the clerks, Spice and all who took the time to give evidence and engage in this process? And in the spirit of reduce, reuse and recycle, I just might repeat most of this speech again in the stage three debate. I think it is important to recognise, as the report does early on, that there are two major aspects to closing the loop as we seek to move from a linear economy where resources are extracted to make products, are then bought, used and thrown away, to a circular economy. Closing the loop to create that circular economy requires action at both ends of what is currently our linear economy. At the start, in terms of reducing the amount of resources that are being extracted and temper consumption, and at the end, in terms of how waste is reduced and managed. The report outlines that more focus is currently on the end stages of this process, and less so on tackling consumption and concrete measures to encourage repair and reuse. To me, that is at least in part due to what powers this Parliament currently has and what powers we know we can use without undue influence from the Tories through the UK Internal Markets Act. I think that so much more could be done to reduce demand for virgin materials, 
to incentivise reusing and recycling materials, to incentivise making and selling products with longer lifespans, and to influence the behaviour of consumers and businesses alike if this Scottish Parliament had more control over affairs in Scotland. Nonetheless, within the powers that we do have here in Scotland, I think this is an ambitious bill that lays the foundations for a better, cleaner and greener tomorrow. It once again shows that Scotland is committed to tackling climate change. The proposals in the bill are in line with the just transition principles, something that's particularly important to so many of my constituents. And you won't be surprised to hear me say is another step in the journey that will see Aberdeen becoming the net zero capital of the world. There are a number of recommendations within the bill that the committee have made, and I want to use my remaining time to focus on just a few. Firstly, this bill is, on the most part, a framework bill, and I'm pleased that this is recognised within the committee report, along with the viewpoint of myself and others, that this is a pragmatic approach. This allows us to keep, up, to keep up the momentum towards a circular economy by creating the broad legal powers the Scottish Government will need. And this setup allows for policy to be further refined following consultation before detailed regulations are made. When it comes to the strategy to achieve a circular economy, the committee report rightfully makes the case that this bill must not disproportionately put the burden for achieving a circular economy onto consumers. There must be accountability for producers for the environmental impacts of the products they make. Products should be designed to be longer lasting, including Ben McPherson's iron, and to be reusable and repairable. For me, that's long been a mark of quality in the report in a product, sorry, and it should be the norm rather than the exception. Ideally, when that product finally does reach the end of its economical lifespan, it should also be easily recycled. The report also goes into great detail about whether targets should be set, what those targets should be, and how those targets will be measured. The report recommendation is that setting targets should be an obligation, not an option. We talk a lot in this chamber, presiding officer, about how Scotland is leading the world on climate change and those targets, if set proportionally with the urgency of what we are facing, will provide a means to ensure that Scotland continues to lead on climate action. When it comes to the disposal of unsold consumer goods, this was supported by the committee to quote the report. Oh. Clearly, it is nobody's best interest for perfectly reusable materials and products to be disposed of rather than redistributed or repurposed. Restrictions could be an effective way of reinforcing measures that many businesses are already putting in place to prevent wastage while also delivering economic and social benefits. Quite bluntly, in the midst of a cost of living crisis, it infuriates me that some companies would rather destroy their stock rather than making it available to others at low or no cost. I'll take an intervention from Mr Golden. Maurice Golden. Uh, I thank the member. Does the member accept that uh, missing eight out of 12 legal emissions targets doesn't chime with being world leading on climate change? Jackie Dunbar. I said it is our ambition to be. I never said that we actually were at this moment in time. It is welcome that the general principles of the bills are supported. And the bill is not perfect at this stage. No bill ever is. And there is work to be done. There are discussions to be had. And there are amendments to be made. And that will be done as this bill progresses. Presiding officer, the principles that, we, that will see Scotland move away from a linear economy and towards having a circular economy are there. And I look forward to seeing this bill move forward to the next stage. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Mark Ruskell to be followed by Murdo Fraser. Thank you, presiding officer. And can I welcome the circular economy bill as it comes to the chamber at stage one? I mean, clearly this bill is not the final destination, but it is a critical step on that journey towards a truly circular economy in Scotland, one where Mr McPherson can easily get his iron repaired anywhere in any community. Now, this committee has unanimously backed the general principles of the bill, 
so there is little division between us on what the bill is seeking to achieve. The bill will drive improvements in household recycling, which sadly have been plateauing for years, and it will tackle littering and fly tipping, and it will deliver greater producer responsibility and reuse further up the waste hierarchy. But I want to address a concern which a number of members have around the nature of this framework bill. And, and I do acknowledge that we are seeing a trend across governments across the UK to rely more heavily on secondary legislation that grants ministers new powers. But this bill recognises that first and foremost that new schemes, for example, that could come forward on food packaging will have to be developed working with businesses, councils and other stakeholders. And that means that it will take time to develop regulations that will actually work in the real world. So putting all of those details up front now on the face of primary legislation would not be in the spirit of co-production that the bill is seeking to develop. But um, briefly, if there's time in hand, yeah. Bob Doris. Would the member also acknowledge there was concerns raised about the impact of the Internal Markets Act and that everything on the face of the bill it may lead to ultimate not compliant, but the flexibility of the framework bill allows us to modify it as we go along? Yeah, absolutely. That's a, that's a key concern. I'm actually going to turn to that um, now because even if there were perfectly formed schemes that could be put into legislation at this point, there would still be the matter of that UK Internal Market Act, an act which allowed Scotland's deposit return scheme to effectively become a plaything of the Secretary of State for Scotland, where permission was withheld until the last minute, only to then be granted, but with a set of conditions that were impossible to meet. Now, the central condition the UK government made on that scheme was a requirement that our DRS must align to an English scheme, which did not exist. And this was, of course, a wrecking ball because the Westminster government has recently announced that it has scrapped plans for DRS for England. Now, there's a better way forward on this. There's a more sensible way forward on schemes and regulations that need to mesh together across the UK, and that's through negotiation and agreement between governments under common frameworks. And there are examples of where this has worked well, particularly with the agreements on single-use plastic bans and most recently on disposable vapes. It shows that Green and Tory ministers working together can actually deliver progress. Uh, I'm sure that that's Mr Simpson's dream. But it would be premature, I think, to put new schemes on the face of primary legislation. Now, where framework legislation is being used, it is important that Parliament is able to scrutinise properly the secondary legislation that will come forward on the back of it. And with the original DRS scheme, the super affirmative procedure allowed Parliament more time to discuss the early regulations with stakeholders. It also gave the government opportunity to amend the legislation before finally laying it in front of Parliament. So I think there is a case for more detailed scrutiny of some of the powers in this bill. And I agree with the committee that the Minister should probably re-examine where it may be appropriate to use a form of super affirmative procedure in some cases. Now, I think it's also important to recognise that this bill does not sit in isolation, so extended producer responsibility across the UK will also be driving progress. And new Scottish legislation is not required in every single area to actually bring in uh, new schemes and approaches. There should be cross-UK collaboration on EPR schemes for items such as vapes and other pro products that have been designed with little thought to their environmental impact and life cycle. And the circular economy strategy, of course, will set out the actions that we've taken in the coming years with the flexibility needed to be informed by emerging data and developments in our understanding of Scotland's use and disposal of goods and materials. So I welcome the provisions in the bill to place restrictions on the disposal of unsold consumer goods. Keeping goods in use for as long as possible before they're then passed on and reused is fundamental to a circular economy. And scrapping items before they've even been used is in no one's interest, except perhaps for the shareholders of Amazon. The provisions on unsold goods mean businesses must start taking different approaches to managing their stock and prioritising good product design at the outset. Now, I'm also pleased that the bill will introduce powers to set new mandatory reporting requirements on businesses and waste surplus. This will improve data that can be then used to inform future strategies. And a number of members have mentioned reducing food waste. That not only reduces our environmental impact, but can, with creative redistribution, address food poverty 
and inequality. Presiding officer, one area where I think improvement could be made in this bill is on making reporting on circularity a part of the process for applying for public sector grants and loans. Currently around £420 million a year in the Scottish budget is allocated as a... I think I'm out of time, unfortunately, but... Um, £420 million allocating the budget supporting uh, businesses or enterprise and trade. So by bringing in requirements into that process, it would be a flexible tool to embed circularity more widely without actually uh, requiring additional cost to public purse. So it's not about setting targets for companies in receipt of public money, but asking them to account for any circularity practices and to outline where they intend to improve. And I think we've heard a number of examples of where that could be brought in. So on, in conclusion, I look forward to the discussion with the Minister as I'm sure many other members do, on this and other matters ahead of stage two, but today very pleased as a Green MSP to support the principles of this bill at stage one. Thank you. And I call Margot Fraser to be followed by Foisal Chowdhury. Thank you, uh, Presiding uh, Officer. Uh, earlier in this debate, making his contribution, Maurice Golden said this was more of a littering and fly-tipping bill than a circular economy bill. He said that like it was a bad thing. I'm very happy to talk about littering and fly tipping. And I would say gently to my, my friend uh, Graham Simpson, I've always considered myself more of a Tober Mori than a great uncle Bulgaria. There will be members in this chamber of a certain vintage who will recognise that allusion to others younger who have no idea uh, what we are uh, referring to, presiding officer. Now, we do have a, a serious, significant and growing problem blighting communities across Scotland with both fly tipping and littering. And we saw some evidence during COVID of an increase in fly tipping, particularly in rural areas, perhaps linked to the fact that many legal routes to dispose of waste were closed due to restrictions on the opening of local authority uh, recycling centres. But this is just not just a rural problem. It is also an issue that affects many parts of urban Scotland, as, as we've already heard in this debate. It's also a problem where we see and we believe there is an increasing role for organised crime seeing this as an easy way to generate a revenue stream where the uh, risks are low, the, 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 the risk of being detected is low, and if caught, uh, the penalties are low. Therefore, it is a way of generating revenue by taking away waste, for, often from uh, legitimate sources, uh, and dumping it, uh, and uh, uh, making cash uh, at a relatively low risk. And I think we need to be aware of that. And with our, we're very much aware of challenges with, with detection of the crime, uh, with enforcement, and with the level of penalties, and whether these act as a suitable uh, uh, incentive. And of course, although people can be prosecuted for severe cases of fly tipping, the number of prosecutions every year is just a handful. Indeed, a large percentage of the reports that go to the Procurator Fiscal Service do not end up in the courts. And again, that's a factor in making this a risk-free way of making money from any criminal gangs. We should not also... Uh, f uh, yes, of course. Jackie Dunbar. I thank the member for taking the intervention. Um, I'm genuinely interested. We were discussing in the committee as part of the evidence regarding um, the disposal of uh, uh, fly tipping. And um, the question was raised a couple of times about who should be responsible or fined. Should it be the person? Sorry, should it be the person um, that that has uh, bought the services of the white man, the white van man, or should it be the householder themselves? I'm very interested to hear what, what your your views on that would be. Uh, Jackie, the bar makes a very good intervention, and if you'll bear with me, I'm about to come on to precisely that point in a, in a, in a, in a, in a moment. But the, what, before I move on to the detail, one other general point I wanted to make was uh, the question of availability and accessibility of legal routes for disposal is important, because the more we make it expensive and difficult to dispose legally of goods, the more incentive we create to fly tip. And we've seen that with local, local authorities, for example, restricting opening hours at recycling centres, in some cases bringing in uh, queuing systems, pre-booking systems, that makes it more difficult to dispose of goods legally, and that creates incentive to fly tip. Now, uh, colleagues will be aware I ran a member's bill consultation uh, on prospective changes in the law, looking at four aspects. Uh, one was improving uh, data collection, an issue that's uh, identified in the Scottish Government strategy as an issue where we have a, a variety of bodies involved, the local authorities, SIPA, uh, Zero Waste Scotland with their dumb dumpers 
uh, hotline that itself has now been dumped, of course, um, and whether we should have a single central point for collecting data, an enhanced duty of care on the waste generator as per the household waste duty of care as existed in England and Wales. That would avoid the issues that Bob Doris highlighted, whereby the householder pays someone to take away the waste, who is not licensed, and then fly tips that. And that puts responsibility back on the householder to make them liable. And then issues around liability on the part of the innocent landowner, the person who has uh, fly tipping put upon their land that has nothing to do with them, but at, at present, as the law stands, they can be held responsible for the cost of dealing with that and removing it, which has always struck me as fundamentally unjust, because what you're doing in that circumstance is you're holding the victim responsible for the crime and making the crime pay. And I know that the National Farmers Union of Scotland in particular have been very exercised about this issue uh, over a long uh, period of time. And the fourth, fourth issue has been around penalties, where previously the fixed penalty notice was just £200, which was not at a level that was acting as a deterrent. So I was very pleased to see the publication of this bill, which goes some way to addressing these concerns. Section 10 of the bill brings in the enhanced duty of care that Jackie Dunbar uh, referred to, and I very much uh, welcome uh, that. I also welcome the changes, not in this bill, but separately, increasing the fixed penalty from £200 to £500. That's a very welcome step. I do wonder whether £500 is sufficient, and I've proposed to the Minister, uh, looking at a sliding scale of penalties that would go from £500 to £2,000, dependent on circumstances, and I would look to bring forward a Stage 2 amendment to this bill uh, that would uh, support that, and that might be a way of funnelling money back in to uh, enforcement and clean-up by local authorities. And that leaves two matters outstanding, data collection and, crucially, this issue of liability on innocent landowners where we have this continued injustice. Now, I very much welcome the engagement I've had uh, with the Minister. It's been very constructive. I was very interested to hear what she had to say earlier about the review of fly tipping enforcement, and we await hearing more from her. So can I thank her for that engagement? Can I thank the engagement I've had with Keep Scotland Beautiful, National Farmers Union of Scotland, Scottish Land uh, and the States? And I hope we can find a positive way forward here. There is no issue of political difference across the Chamber in terms of addressing this issue of littering and fly tipping, which are scourges upon our environment, on our economy, on our natural beauty, which are costing public uh, resources and also uh, costing uh, private owners of land. Let's hope we can all work together to find a solution, presiding officer. Thank you. And I call Faisal Chowdhury to be followed by Fulton McGregor. Thank you. Presiding officer, in Scotland, figures suggest we use more than double the sustainable limit of materials. To tackle the climate crisis, we must tackle overconsumption and create a circular economy where materials are valued and can be cycled around our economy for as long as possible. However, the current circular economy Scotland bill does not go far enough to do this and seems more like a recycling bill than a full circular economy bill. It does not provide a thorough enough framework for action for the bills aimed to be successfully implemented, monitored and evaluated across all areas of a circular economy to ensure Scotland meets important climate targets. More emphasis is needed on opportunities for carbon-based consumption reduction targets and ambitious interim targets to be implemented and measured so that we can ensure that circular economy bill is meeting its purpose in tackling climate change. More attention must also be uh, given to how uh, implementation of legis legislation will work with third parties, including local businesses and local authorities. If we have learned anything from the deposit return scheme uh, <coughs> uh, vehicle it is that the Scottish Government must create through uh, actionable policies which have been thought out in partnership with businesses and local authorities and do not place significant uh, bureaucratic burden on small and medium enterprises. Some sectors have already been able to take 
steps to reuse materials and the Scottish Government should build on that by helping local businesses improve their reuse recycle processes. The Scottish Government will also need to work alongside and properly uh, resources local authorities. Instead, there has so far been a significant underestimation of uh, funding needed uh, to enable our local authorities to deliver on a circular economy, leaving our local authorities with yet another funding crisis they will have to uh, pre precariously juggle. Presiding officer, it is important that the circular economy bill recognizes and prioritizes a climate justice approach. Research by the IPCC predicts a worrying future in raising number of climate migrants who will be uh, displaced because of climate effects. The circular economy bill could provide a stable circular economy which will support climate refugees, not contribute to the problems which cause displacement from their homes, uh, from their home countries. We must build a strong, skilled and engaged workforce. The introduction of a circular economy skill passport could upskill people to work in the uh, reuse repair sector, supporting access to sustainable economy uh, opportunity. To achieve climate justice in this bill, we'll also need monitoring on and accountability for exported materials to ensure that Scotland doesn't simply move its waste to other countries, shifting the climate burden and its mission to meet its own waste targets. Presiding officer, this bill will not change public behaviour overnight. We need more investment in behavioural charity projects to, to facilitate the cultural shift needed to support cultural economy by helping people acquire more sustainable lifestyle through reuse, redu reduce repair awareness. I recently co-sponsored with Maggie Chapman MSP a circular economy showcase uh, outside the Scottish Parliament. This event was a collaborative uh, initiative between Friends of the Art Scotland, Plastic Free Scotland Communities, Edinburgh Street Teachers, Shrub uh, Reset Scenario, Marine Conservation Society, Circular Community Scotland, and Edinburgh and Lothian's Regional Equality Council, ELREC, which I chair. I refer the members to my register of interest. The showcase demonstrated how we could transform the way we view and use materials in Scotland, exposing the potential for a circular economy uh, if this bill provides a sufficient structural and cultural basis for change. Working together, a circular economy is the right direction. But we cannot see a half-hearted attempt with ill-thought-out implementation mechanism, weakly uh, curved out targets, poor monitoring of effectiveness and lack of support for industry and local authorities. Scottish Labour are committed to ensuring this bill is properly uh, scrutinised and made as robust as possible as it progresses through Parliament to ensure that Scotland's uh, commitment to climate action is progressed and more sustainable plan, uh, planet can be built for all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Fulton McGregor, the final speaker in the open debate. Yeah, thank you, President Officer. The Scottish Government have made it clear that the climate emergency is one of the most important issues we will ever face, and it requires a multidisciplinary approach to tackle. Transforming our economy into a more circular one is one of the key areas we can invest in in order to respond to this crisis. Now, I'm not a member of the committee that's been looking at this bill, but it is, President Officer, a great honour to speak, and I'll take the opportunity today to mention some local initiatives. But as we debate the general principles of the bill, the key message is that this bill will enable Scotland to increase reuse and recycle rates by introducing a range of measures to discourage throwaway culture. We have heard the term reduce, reuse, recycle since the 70s, and this, in essence, is what a circular economy is. Resource extraction is reduced by promoting the reusing of materials and products. In turn, anything that must be discarded should be recycled, so the most value can be taken 
from any waste products. We must move away Presiding officer, from the current model of a linear economy, where it is where we take resources from the ground, air and water, make them into products and structures, and then dispose of them. By transitioning away from this type of economy into a circular model, we will remain on track to meet the commitments of our climate change plan, which is envisioned that by 2045, Scotland would have a focus on responsible production, responsible consumption and ability, and an ability to maximise the value from waste and energy. In looking at our own track record, we have done well. More than half of Scotland's waste was recycled in 2021. The amount of waste that has been sent to landfills has dropped by a third over a decade. We also have reduced all waste by 15 per cent, and our emissions from the waste management sector have dropped by over 75 per cent since 1990. While these figures are encouraging, we must continue these trends and, most, important, most importantly, legislate in a manner that makes sustainable choices easier and more routine for businesses and households alike. And with that in mind, it is vital to remember that these measures that we are looking to introduce are being done in an intricate and elaborate Scottish, UK, European and global landscape. Things that this chamber cannot legislate for are reserved issues such as VAT, product standards, product labelling and consumer protection. And we must encourage the UK Government to also work towards a circular economy. And we must also look at this in the international context of, for example, um, COVID, the COVID pandemic, Brexit, the war in Ukraine and the crisis in Gaza. I have also mentioned that the fact that encouraging a circular economy would open new markets and stimulate economic opportunities in Scotland. The legislation would support the establishment and growth in green businesses and initiatives. Examples of this would include Vegware, who are the only company in the UK to develop, manufacture and distribute a full range of completely compostable food packaging and, create, and creating di disposables. And also Retronics, who are an organisation in my constituency and that I know well and have visited previously. They, cover, they recover, repair and use ele reuse electrical components. Their work restores the functionality of electrical, electronic parts that might otherwise be considered obsolete and inefficient and would have ended up in a landfill in the past. And I want to pay tribute to the work that Retronics do in Coatbridge and further afield. These are just examples of initiatives that would not have existed a few decades ago, but are currently growing and promoting more transparent ethical industry standards. And although I have spoken about global issues in the climate emergency which will affect the whole planet, a huge benefit of this bill is its ability to work on a local level by giving local councils increased powers in promoting the circular economy. Funding to increase these powers is based off the £70 million Recycling Improvement Fund. Some of these powers include giving local authorities more enforcement powers to tackle things such as littering from cars and fly tipping and increasing collaboration between the Scottish Government and local authorities to design national codes of practice for household waste recycling. And I would agree with what other speakers have said. The, the issues of fly tipping and uh, general littering are a, a, a real plight in my constituency area as well as others. As I have said, the strength of the bill is the influence it will have on a local level. And I want to take some time to also talk about Viridor, the recycling, renewable energy and waste management company, who have a regional office in Burgady within my constituency. And if the Minister has not already visited them, I would put an invite to her. They are a very good organisation. Viridor have exemplified a circular economy in action through the use of combustion chambers to convert waste into usable energy. This energy is then exported to the national grid, powering and heating tens of thousands of homes, while saving thousands of tonnes of CO2 emissions annually. Organisations like Viridor actively support the national energy grid by diversifying energy sources and critically reducing dependence on fossil fuels. I have visited Vir Viridor several times since becoming an MSP, and I can test they also see the importance of community engagement and have often uh, given back to the community through initiatives such as educational awareness programmes in schools and clubs across the country. And these initiatives have underlined the importance of promoting a circular economy and instilling a sense of collective responsibility for our futures. Viridor's mission statement with regard to a circular economy is to lead the way with, a building, with building a world where nothing goes to waste. And I also have to say they're a major employer in my local area. And again, I thank them for that and for basing themselves there. In conclusion, presiding officer, we all know the importance of a circular economy. This bill is a way that we can encourage a circular economy through legislative means. I acknowledge that this is a multidisciplinary issue too, and non-legislative means of transitioning to a circular economy can be encouraged. 
such as fostering a sense of collective responsibility for waste management and awareness campaigns to ensure that all parts of Scottish society play their part in this transition. I support the general principles of the Bill, thank the Committee for their work so far, and I encourage the Chamber to do likewise. Thank you. Thank you. We move to winding up speeches, and I call on Alec Rowley. Up to six minutes, please. I thank you, President Officer, and I am grateful for the opportunity to close this debate on behalf of the Scottish Labour Party. Ultimately, if we are truly to realise the potential that this bill sets out in its ambitious title to deliver a circular economy for Scotland, it is essential that the next stages of this process strengthen this legislation so that it is capable of delivering on its aims. If we look at the government's failure to deliver on the deposit return scheme, businesses were let down at a cost of over £86 million. Not to mention the fact that businesses felt like no one was prepared to listen to them. So hopefully this time we will be listening. If we look at the government's failure to deliver on their rhetoric on just transition for workers, workers are being let down, such as in the case of Grangemouth, where again they feel like they're not being listened to. It is clear to me, as it is, I believe, to many in this chamber, it is one thing for this government to talk a good game on their green credentials, but quite another when it comes to actually delivering. My view is that the real failure of the deposit return scheme legislation was the argumentative approach the government took to any criticism or concerns that were raised. This government, this government seems to believe that by simply forcing legislation through, any unanswered questions will just disappear. Yeah. Who's Mark yeah, OK, thank the member for giving way. I wonder if the member would just acknowledge the views of the Welsh Labour First Minister, who acknowledged the fact that the UK government had stepped in to block Scotland's deposit return scheme. And in fact, now the Welsh government has exactly the same problems as we have in Scotland, and a difficulty in trying to align their own deposit return scheme with an English scheme, which just simply does not exist because the UK government has scrapped it. Alec Crowley. Well, I hope once we have a change in the UK government uh, at some point this year, we will have certainly a government in Westminster that wants to work with a government in Scotland. And once we have a change in two years' time in a Labour government here, then we'll certainly have two governments that will work together. But whether, whether it's going to war with the UK government, refusing to respond to the concerns of small businesses, or pulling the plug on the scheme altogether, despite its own scheme administrator saying that alternative permitted scheme would be absolutely viable, the government often seemed to opt for the path of most resistance. So I urge the government to do not make the same mistakes again with this legislation recognise that delivering a truly circular economy for Scotland is not only in all our best interests, it's likely to be supported by the majority of MSPs in this chamber if the legislation proposed achieves what it sets out to achieve. If we all work together on this bill, we could deliver a truly transformative piece of legislation, not simply another bill dealing with recycling. Organisations supportive of the general principles of this bill, such as Consumer Scotland, Action to Protect Rural Scotland, Friends of the Earth Scotland, and many others, have all been clear that the legislation needs to be stronger if it's going to have the desired impact. Consumer Scotland say it's important that work does not focus disproportionately on waste management and disposal. In order to achieve the transformational change required, action must be prioritised higher up the waste hierarchy and address the problem of overconsumption and unsustainable resource use. APRS agrees on this point, calling on the waste hierarchy to be made explicit within the bill, while also suggesting further necessary amendments on take-back targets, refillable and resumable uh, packaging, conditionality on public spending, and introducing enhanced reporting for companies in receipt of public funding. Friends of the Earth Scotland support the creation of the bill 
but it is clear that it needs improvement to ensure it is as robust as it can be as they call for the inclusion of mandatory carbon-based consumption reduction targets, among other additions to the Bill. So, in summary, the organisations who are supportive of the Bill point to the great work carried out by the Net Zero Energy and Transport Committee and urge the Government to consider their recommendations carefully to strengthen the Bill. The Finance and Public Administration Committee also raised concerns about the financial implications of the bill, and I have raised that with the Minister in terms of local government and the fact that local government is struggling right now. The government cannot ignore these concerns. Local authority budgets are also already overstretched, and if this legislation is not resourced properly, then it simply will not work. So, in conclusion, President Officer, while we are broadly supportive of the principles of this bill, it is clear that there is much work to be done to ensure that the legislation lives up to the ambitious aims that it sets out in its name. Thank you. And I call on Douglas Lumsden up to seven minutes, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer, and uh, I thank my colleagues for this interesting uh, debate around an issue I think we all agree requires um, action. And I also want to thank the committees who have considered this bill in great detail and for the witnesses who have given their time to submit evidence on these measures and, of course, the clerks of the Net Zero Committee who somehow managed to capture our views and get into a report that we could uh, all agree on. And we've heard many interesting contributions today focusing on the intentions of the bill and how it will work in practice. And as the committee report points out, there is uh, a lot that is unsaid, unknown and unexplained within the proposed bill. And I share the concerns of the committee in this area. Mm -hmm. But we do all agree on the principle that legislation to assist the development of our circular economy in Scotland is required. Yep. This bill, however, needs a lot of work before it is fit for purpose. Yep. And I look forward to being involved in the process to improve it. Many of my colleagues have outlined some of the concerns that the committee had when considering this legislation. And I note the Minister's response to the committee outlining the acceptance of many of the recommendations that were made. And this is helpful, and I hope that we can work together to improve the bill moving forward. And as other colleagues have noted, the committee found it challenging to scrutinise the bill, given it is a framework legislation with much of the details being added later. This makes us all nervous, as we should not be agreeing to legislation that is unclear. We are not a fill-in-the-blanks later parliament, or at least no. we shouldn't be. And as a former councillor and council leader, I have specific concerns around the additional burdens that this legislation will place on local authorities, particularly around increased centralised control in terms of targets. I support action on increasing household recycling practices, and I welcome uh, the, the Minister's comments today about removing the potential uh, penalties to local authorities. But they need to work with them more and look at ways to reward local authorities that do meet their targets. And it's vitally important that the Scottish Government continue to meet with COSLA to discuss these measures and how they are to be implemented fully in agreement in line with the Verity House Agreement. And I have real concerns on the financial burden this will place on our local authorities. And I asked the Minister what additional funding will be made available to local authorities to assist with implementation and additional reporting and recording that will be required as a result of this legislation. An increase to the value of recycle it will not cover it. And, President Officer, I just want to turn to some of the other contributions we've heard Today. We've heard from the Finance Committee, and that was uh, quite a contribution. We've heard of the, the concern of the lack of certainty, the lack of costs, underestimated costs, costs from Zero Waste Scotland to local authorities, hearing that the co-design could and should be used up front, and risks that the bill is unaffordable, and the, 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 the FM not being adequate. A framework bill is always, this is always going to be the case. We've heard from my colleague Maurice Golden. He said that the bill as drafted won't deliver a circular economy. 
It's a waste and litter bill. Little detail. No guarantee of when or even if things will change. Yes, I'll take an intervention. Liam Kerr. I'm very grateful. I'm just listening very carefully to what the member is saying. If this is a framework bill such that the government can later bring back extra bits and tack extra things onto it, how can this parliament adequately scrutinise the finances that are being proposed? Mm. Douglas Lomston. Uh, well, I think Liam Kerr this hit the, the nail on the head, and I think we heard that from the, the Finance Committee. They can't. They cannot see what's going to be coming forward in terms of the, the regulations and what that... Uh, is going to put the costs are going to be to our local authorities. Morris Golden also raised that uh, ministers need to be more accountable for missed targets. He raised the point that targets have been missed for, I think it's eight out of the last 12. But no, no minister has, has, been, has resigned over this. It's just simply yeah. it's missed and things carry on as, yeah. as they were before. Bob Doris talk about behavioural change, and I completely uh, agree with uh, Bob Doris on this. And maybe the focus should be on that rather than uh, legislation. And Murdo Fraser, or Uncle B Bulgaria, as he will now be referred to, spoke... I'll, I'll, I'll give way to Bob Doris. Bob Doris. Just briefly, because we... I was sit on the same committee as Mr Lumsden, but just for clarity, the committee did come together and we did agree there was legislative change required, not just behavioural change. We didn't listen to think that Mr Lumsden didn't support legislation because he clearly did his part of the committee, unanimously. I think maybe Mr. Mr. Doris wasn't listening to when I, I, I spoke earlier that legislation was welcome, but my, I think the focus should maybe be on the behavioural change that even he discussed, because I think that's where we, we can have greater impact than uh, the legislation that's before us. Uh, Mardo Fraser spoke of the blight of fly tipping. I think you know, all of us have uh, probably received uh, emails about that, and it's a rural and urban problem. It's not just one or the other. And he spoke about the criminals that are making money from this and the need to make it easier for people to dispose legally of the goods that they no longer require. Sarah Boyk and Graham Simpson raised the point again about um, that households could be criminalised for someone else putting something else in the wrong item in, in, in their, their bins. I will indeed. Minister. Just to be very clear, it is already a crime not, not to desist from contaminating recycling if you have been uh, issued a notice. That is already a crime. The bill does not create a new criminal offence. What it does is give a more proportionate and milder enforcement option for councils should they wish to use it. Douglas Lumsden. Yeah, yeah, I thank the Minister for that, but I think what she hasn't recognised that you know, people could put out their bin and uh, they've got the right things in it, and then somebody else comes along afterwards and then contaminates their bin, and that person may be, be penalised. Uh, Liam MacArthur spoke about the lack of detail and difficult to understand the impact that this uh, bill will make. Ben McPherson spoke about the reuse and refurbishment and the remakery. We both visited the, the remakery as part of the, uh, the committee work. Maybe he should have looked for an iron when we were at the, uh, at the remakery. Maybe we've got one for, at, a, at a good price. And he also spoke about construction. And there's nothing actually about construction in this bill. And maybe that would be, be welcome, because as Ben McPherson did point out, it is a, a large amount of a waste that is produced is from that uh, industry. In conclusion, President Officer, this legislation could have been a step in the right direction, but there are so many questions around it that a lot of work needs to be done to get it right. As I said at the start of my remarks, there is still too much that is unclear, unknown and unsaid. We fully support the need to move towards our circular economy, but for that we need certainty and a clear strategy of how we are going to get there. Businesses involved in this sector are leading the way. We must listen to them and ensure that we are taking them with us on this journey. Local authorities will be at the forefront of delivering this strategy. And again, we have to ensure that we are working hand in hand to achieve the goals. I remain concerned, President Officer, that the record of this government is not a good one when it comes to those measures. Yeah. We have seen in the past businesses have been let down and feel abandoned by this government. Councils are dismayed at the decisions being taken by the government and the breaking of the Verity House Agreement. We have seen previous schemes in this sector, such as the DRS, fail because of lack of competence. And that lack of competence is there for us all to see today, the day that the Climate Change Committee published their damning report on Scotland's progress yeah. on reducing its emissions. Chris Stark's criticism conclude, of the SNP please, Green Olmsted. Government was brutal and unprecedented, yet thoroughly merited. Yeah. 
I hope that the current record of failed legislation from this government can be changed. Scotland deserves better, and our Thank industry you, Mr. will rely on us I getting must this right. Ask expect you to more. Conclude. I look forward to this debate moving forward. Thank you, Mr. And Lumsden. I hope we can work collaboratively to make this bill fit for purpose. Mr. Lumsden, I would suggest in future that when you were asked to conclude, you do so. Thank you. And I call on Lorna Slater to wind up, up to eight minutes, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I want to thank all the contributions today, except possibly the last few lines of Mr. Lumsden's there, uh, for their constructive, if robust, nature today. I'm very pleased that there is consensus across the Parliament on the principles of the bill and that such measures are necessary for moving us towards a circular economy bill. I'm particularly um, um, pleased to hear that there is support across the chamber for things like standardising recycling across Scotland, notwithstanding the special needs of islands and other rural communities. I want to remind members, of course, that this bill sits in the context of our a waste route map, which contains our strategy and am wider ambitions in this area. Yes, certainly. Maurice Golden. Uh, I'm just wondering what assessment has been done on the financial cost of consistent collections to local authorities. Minister. Uh, what I want the member to understand is that I am committed to working with COSLA to understand what a standardised code of practice will look like. So I must, we must go through that co process with COSLA to understand what that will look like and part of that process will be understanding what funding is required for that process. So that is something we'll be working on together with COSLA. But, uh, Mr Mountain, Sarah Boyack and others uh, reiterated arguments during this debate about the framework and nature of the bill with the concern that it brings a reduced opportunity for scrutiny, including financial scrutiny. As I said in my response to the committee's report, for each regulation-making power, the Parliament should have suitable opportunity to ensure that the regulations are robust and fit for purpose, and this will be ensured through the procedures set out in the bill for scrutiny of secondary legislation. Where Scottish ministers are intending to co-design any provisions, the bill ensures that consultation is embedded in the process. This bill achieves the appropriate balance between the importance of developing a more circular economy and the need to provide flexibility to allow ministers... Certainly, one more. Sarah Boyack. The key sets of recommendations was about super affirmative approach rather than just, you know, putting together secondary legislation to get nodded through. We need to have that constructive dialogue and accountability, not just with our committees, but with key stakeholders. Minister. And I indeed look forward to a constructive dialogue with the member and other members in this chamber on what we may achieve in that direction. This bill does need to provide and does provide that appropriate balance for ministers to allow ministers to respond to changing and unforeseen circumstances quickly without the need for further primary legislation every time a change is needed. It also helps ensure the proper use of parliamentary time is made. And I note that stakeholders, including ENGOs, COSLA and business bodies, have welcomed the framework and nature of this bill. There have been a number of comments in relation to how the bill would be funded. The route map sets out that there will be a review of funding mechanisms for services to ensure modern, efficient and affordable outputs. That review will build on key findings from long-term investment, including the over £1 billion made through the former Strategic Waste Fund between 2008 and 2022, the Recycling Improvement Fund and the new provisions set out in the Circular Economy Scotland Bill. John Mason and others have referenced the financial memorandum, and since that financial memorandum was published, further awards have been made under the Recycling Improvement Fund, which has now allocated £60.6 million to 25 local authorities. These are already starting the process to help more local authorities align with the existing code of practice. The financial memorandum represents a snapshot in time, and more detailed costs will be the result of ongoing refinement as we work with local authorities and householders to develop the detail. Regulations made under enabling powers will be subject to further consultation, parliamentary scrutiny, and impact assessments, including business regulatory impact assessments and island impact assessments. By necessity, the financial memorandum provides strategic level cost and benefit data and I am committed to updating the finance and NZ committees as regulations are developed. Morris Golden, Sarah Boyack and others have argued that the bill focuses on the lower end of the waste hierarchy, particularly on recycling and household waste. It doesn't. 
Reducing consumption of materials is a fundamental driver for the circular economy strategy, for example. And I would uh, suggest members look at sections one and six of the bill. Section one of the bill is about setting that strategy, and it mentions reduction consumption of materials three times. In section six of the bill, which talks about setting targets, it is mentioned four times. Reducing consumption of materials through that effective waste hierarchy is absolutely at the heart of the bill. And the provisions of the bill help bring this about. Charges for single-use items are included to incentivize the use of reusable items, which we have all seen with the charge on bags, which has driven all of us to bring, bring and keep reusable bags for the purpose of shopping. Restrictions on the destruction of unsold goods is also a key means to ensuring goods are used by those who need them. Reuse is a key theme of the route map, including, including exploring reuse hubs for construction materials. Of course, some areas relevant to tackling overconsumption and taking on system of system-wide approach, such as VAT, product standards, product labeling, and consumer protection are reserved. But the, the strategy will focus on devolved matters. Sorry, I need to get through time now. Uh, Mr. Mountain and Sarah Boyack and several other members have raised the issue of the Internal Market Act. Please be reassured, members, that the Circular Economy Bill does not contain any provisions on the face of the bill which would trigger the application of the Internal Market Act. It contains no provisions which in themselves would prohibit the sale of goods or in the case of an obligation or condition result in their sale being prohibited if it is not complied with. Further consideration will, of course, need to be given to the IMA when and where the powers under the bill are exercised. This is in line with the Scottish Government's overall approach to manage the risk that the IMA poses to laws passed by the Scottish Parliament. The Scottish Government engages regularly with the Office of the Internal Market and will continue to do so. Of course, the Scottish Government, like the UK Government, is under no obligation to seek policy advice from the OIM on draft legislation. We have already highlighted the Circular Economy Bill to the UK and other uh, UK administrations through the relevant common framework. Ben McPherson asked about construction in relation to the bill. Following the first use of the reporting provisions to cover food waste and surplus, and surplus construction is another potential candidate for the use of those powers. Construction is also a priority within the route map, and more widely, the built environment is also regularly identified as an important system in research in this area. For example, the Circularity Gap Report, and I'd therefore expect construction to be reflected as a key sector within the circular economy strategy too. And I do have a soldering iron, Ben, if your problem's electrical, I may be able to help you out. <laughs> Uh, Monica Lennon raised the issue of reusable nappies, and I look forward to visiting North Ayrshire Council with her on Monday the 25th to learn more about that council's real nappy incentive scheme, and we'll be publishing research that we have commissioned on barriers to use of reusable na nappies shortly. Um, I note uh, Murdo Fraser's comments around fly tipping and share his concern and uh, you know, need for urgency in tackling fly tipping and waste crime, uh, and I'm looking forward to meeting with the member again to see if we can support the intentions and aims of his member's bill, potentially through amendments to the circular economy bill. I'd like to thank members for their detailed scrutiny of this bill, which has yielded many suggestions upon which I will reflect. I am pleased to say that I will do so and continue to do so with an open mind and was grateful to the members who have recognized uh, that I am open-minded and uh, Jeff, welcome their contributions to this process. I have greatly enjoyed the debate today and I look forward to stage two when we will look at the amendments and to working with members from across the chamber to make this bill a success. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes the debate on Circular Economy Scotland Bill at stage one. Oh, point of order, Douglas Lumsden. Uh, th thank you, President Officer. Um, just to um, put on record that um, I was a councillor um, at Aberdeen City Council at the start of this session. I made reference to that in my uh, contribution. Thank you, Mr Lumsden. Your comments are recorded. We will momentarily move on to the next item of business.